Well, good day uh, and welcome, uh, John Lamb Lash. It's a real honor and pleasure to have you here today. Likewise for me. Uh, I wanted to just do a brief introduction. My name is Kathleen Dudley. I'm a holistic practitioner in uh, uh, Northern New Mexico. And um, I have been doing some research and study um, as I've been writing a book called Women's Worth, Man's Worth, The Overfed Body, The Underfed Soul. And back in uh, 2013, I began to really take a look at the situation with our men, the crisis of our men. And I began to observe it on a, from a physical level um, and, and more from the environmental perspective. And so it was going to take up about a chapter in my book, that aspect of it. But as the years have rolled on, and specifically the last year and a half to two years, I've begun to put pieces together and realizing that there is an outright attack to annihilate our men, the very heart of our, of our, of our society, of our, of our humanity. And, and I have begun looking at it from so many different perspectives. And in the process, I was introduced to John Lamb Lash's book, Not in His Image, which answered and is still answering many questions that I've had. And I have the pleasure today to have John in this conversation. And what we're going to be discussing is the historical um, references to how we have come to this crisis today and where our men are, and also look at solutions to um, help that healing begin. And it all also obviously will involve discussions about our women, because we cannot discuss our men without our women, because we are an integral connection as we are with nature and as we are with the whole. So John, uh, again, welcome. And if you could do an introduction and, um, and then we can get into the meat of all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. I would like to say to listeners that I'm here today with my reputation, of course. A man cannot con entirely control his reputation, for good or worse, right? Um, but I'm not here as an author. I'm not here as uh, the creator of various websites, uh, not here as the self-taught Gnostic scholar who presented Gnosticism, brought it back to the world as I believe it truly ought to be represented today, but I'm, uh, and also I'm here as uh, a gener um, representative of the 1960s generation so I'm really here just as another man. Uh, you can disregard whatever my credentials are. Uh, I'm just uh, a veteran of the gender wars. Battle scarred, learned from my defeats more than from my successes. So I'm here really to talk from the heart as a man and to talk about my recovery process as a man, which uh, I don't advise anyone, but I can speak of what I went through to recover my sense of manhood. And again, as I just mentioned, uh, important point, I am a veteran of the 1960s sexual revolution. And I have some things to say about what that was, really was, and about what it can mean for us today. So that's how I present myself today. Thank you, John. Very good. All right. Well, John, could, you know, I think with anything, we always need to understand where something has come from. We're, we're in a war today. It's a war against humanity. And we we look outside and we don't see paratroopers falling from the sky. We don't see tanks. We don't hear machine guns. We, we don't see the landscape of a war that we have been taught looks like from television and the social media and Hollywood. 
but we are definitely in a war, a spiritual war against humanity, a physical war against humanity, a war against our hearts, a war against our, our minds, a war against our bodies. And that war has been going on for a very long time. It has just morphed into a different form, a different quality of war. Could you please give us an historical understanding of how this simple life connected with nature and, 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 and living from our, our hearts and love and connection to one another, how that became so degraded and so complicated and ultimately now destroyed? Very question question we all live with, whether we are able to formulate it or not, right? Um, and of course, uh, root goes back a long ways. We're not going to take apart all the filaments of the root here. We'll just refer to some of them. I'd like to strike a balance in this talk, and we agreed on this earlier, between talking about the problem and talking about the solution. The problem is religion. That is the problem. And it is the Abrahamic religions in particular, although I don't exclude Buddhism or Hinduism or Confucianism, because in those religions as well, you find uh, a sex negative and problematical attitude toward what I call the gender binary. You see, to me, the gender binary, which is the heterosexual male-female relationship, that dynamic and all it entails, uh, companionship, love, family, pleasure, pleasure is a very important part in our recovery. Yes. Uh, all of that has been under attack for millennia, but it is only, you can trace it forward into historical times and it really kicked into gear uh, in the 17th century with the Sabbatean Frankist apostasy, as it's called. And it really kicked into gear coming forward from my generation in the 60s when the corruption and degeneration of the youth uh, escalated to an industrial scale. And I was on the front lines of that battle. And yet, I'm living proof that you can survive and come through it with a sane and humane attitude towards sexuality, you see? So speaking as an author for a moment, and you know my book well, and I appreciate it uh, when people can speak back to me what I say in my book accurately. It's not because I want people to parrot me, but in that way, we have a clear dialogue, a clear communication on solid foundations. So the root of it began with the Abrahamic religions, which can historically be dated to about 1800 BC. But it took a long, long time. It took a long time to root the human animal out of its empathic con connection to nature. It took a long time to destroy the roots of human sexuality in nature. You see, there's really a, a triangle of human sexuality. You could say the basis of the triangle is the gender binary, men and women. But the peak of that triangle is, is nature itself. Yeah. And just as you see in nature, what we now recognize, some people do at least, to have the intelligence and the respect, we recognize something called an ecosystem. We didn't create those ecosystems. The divine mother herself creates and maintains them. But there is something like a sexual ecosystem. And we are responsible for creating and maintaining that. And the attack on that goes back a long, long way, as you know. But primarily comes forward to things that we can talk about, which are more current. So I would prefer to talk, I'm going to talk a little about what was entailed in the destruction 
of what I will call the pagan aesthetic. You see, pagan life, what pagan simply means paganus, somebody who lives in the country, somebody who's in touch with nature. And anybody who lives in touch with nature today knows that the primary signature of nature is beauty. And so her beauty is around us everywhere. Beauty is the theme of the ecosystem. So in the pagan way of life, which I don't idealize at all, I don't mean to do that. When you go back and you study ancient cultures and ancient history from primary sources, you learn a lot about the problems that men and women had with each other and about the different arrangements that they made. And nothing was ever ideal, but it was a long way better from what we're looking at today. So talking about the source of evil, I'd like to make this caveat. This is something essential for everyone to understand whether we're talking about uh, the gender binary, the, the gender wars, the problems between the sexes or politics or education or anything. In the ecosystems of nature, you see competition but you also see mutual aid. And take, for example, animals of different species that live together side by side, like wolves and caribou. If you go and look at this ecosystem, well, okay, wolves may prey on caribou. Caribou can also kill wolves. They can decimate them, they're very powerful. But there is, a, there is a balance, you see, between them. Now, suppose we heard reports coming out of Canada. Oh, wait a minute. Something very alarming has happened. Suddenly, the ecosystem, the balance of the ecosystem between wolves and caribou has gone completely haywire. And they're not behaving as they normally would. And Wolves are acting erratically. They're being over aggressive. Caribou are acting in another way. How could anything like that happen? It could only happen by the intervention of a third party. And the essential lesson that everyone needs to know and needs to study is that the derangement and degeneration of sexual relationships today is due to the influence of a third party yeah. who wants to destroy both sexes and to produce a demented notion of a hermaphroditic or transsexual human entity, which is the ideal of the Kabbalah. So we're not gonna go deeply into that. That's the root of the problem, but it's important to recognize that is the root of the problem. So we could talk about that obviously for an hour, but I would rather go into the current issues that we face in sexuality today, always keeping that in the back of our minds. How does that play with you? And, and I think John, it might be that we, we might need to go into just that very issue on another interview, just to, um, because there's so much to that. And, um, but, but please go, go forward. Well, I use the term uh, gender binary to kind of as, as a dose of sanity to restore us to sanity. Uh, the transhumanist technocrats who today are the agents and inheritors of this evil program, I call the righteous third party, those that tell us how we must live. Well, they have attempted to destroy the gender binary and the sexual ecosystem of man and woman, you see? And uh, that began in the pagan times. Yes. And uh, it didn't really kick into gear until Christianity came along. Now, it was in, in the background because the particular cult that carries this uh, nefarious anti-human extraterrestrial influence was incubating in small cells. 
and it hadn't gone viral. It went viral in Christianity. I explain exactly how this happened in my book. And so what happens with Christian ideology and Christian morality from the first centuries is uh, you begin to see the declarations of war against nature and sex. So sex is identified with sin, original sin. Nature is evil. It's full of evil spirits. Don't go out in nature and frolic around and have a good time and dance and, and show physical. Don't do any of that. That's where Christianity started to bring in its message. But it took centuries for them to make that message effective because it is so anti-human. It's so against human nature and nature. So you have to bear in mind that there were centuries of aggression uh, and they were not successful in many ways, even though they converted the different European peoples, the like Teutonic peoples, the Scandinavian, the French, the Iberian peoples of Spain, they never really converted them because they kept to their native ways. This is a very well-known story. I'm sure you're aware of that. And the same thing is true in the Americas. When they brought the virus of salvationism to America and imposed it on the natives with violence, the natives retained and still do to this day their love of nature and their connection with the natural world. Yes, and I, I, I live in a I live in an area of, of northeastern New Mexico. It's a land-based people, land-based culture. And um, people people are living on the land, they're tilling their earth, they're 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 celebrating that the spring is here and 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 the birthing of 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 all the you know young animals. It's um you know it's it's definitely apparent everywhere I go. In, in, in this area that I live. Well, I know because I live there as well. Yes. And you probably know how much I love New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most, some of the most sublime experiences of my life I've had there in mm -hmm. the Sangre de Cristos, unfortunately named the Blood of Christ Mountains. <laughs> but that is actually due to a natural effect do you know where that name comes from? This is a good example of how Christianity has imposed its ideology upon natural perception. I actually don't, but I look right out onto the Sangre de Cristos. Well, in Santa Fe, we look right due east to the Sangre de Cristos, and you can go up there 7,000 feet. There's something that happens often in Santa Fe. So you're on this plane, and the Alameda River comes and feeds into the Rio Grande. And then you see the Sangres to the east. And when the sun goes down to the west, it happens in certain seasons more than others. Possibly, I think, in the fall season. Yes, they go but blood red. They go into a blood red color when the horizontal light comes across. So that is a natural phenomenon, but the Christians have come along and have arrived and said, no, no, no. You cannot see that as the blood of your earth mother. You have to see it as <laughs> Sangre de Christos, the blood of Christ. And wow. we could cite dozens of, dozens of examples. So they impose this alien, extra-human, anti-human ideology for centuries and the indigenous peoples held on to the connection to the earth as you know as best they could but it has been a long long battle and the adversaries of life the enemies of life as i call them the psychotics uh, that you see in politics and in philanthropic organizations and in the world economic forum these great philanthropists who are here to tell us how we're going to live, how we must live, uh, are carrying forward this program. It, it started as a religious ideology and it has now become the technocratic transhumanist ideology. 
And it is a massive weapon against all of the human races. Yes, yes. So what I find helpful is to bear in mind always that triangle, nature at the top and male and female at the bottom of the triangle. So uh, the war that has been going on, as you rightly pointed out before we started the interview, was specifically directed toward men. But actually, if you go back and look at Genesis, it was actually specifically directed toward women as well, because Eve is the perpetrator. Eve is the one who ate the apple, right? It all started with Eve, right? So there's an attack on the female, an attack on the male from the very beginning of that ideology, from the moment it was conceived in the Semitic languages. Mm -hmm. It's an ideology that comes in the world, to the world uniquely through the Semitic languages, which is Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. And I can assure you as a comparative mythologist who studied the mythologies of all the cultures of the world from Polynesia to the Ural Mountains, the Native American cultures of North and South America, all the classical cultures of the world, of Japan, of China, you do not find this ideology in any of those other cultures. It comes uniquely through the Semitic languages. Semitic is a language designation. It's not a racial designation, right? So uh, the targeting began a long time ago. And today we're looking at really the end game, I think. It's, it's win or die. It's do or die now. I think you would agree on that. Well, I, I would. And I, I, as we've talked, you know, when you, when you take out the power, power source of our, of our society, our men, you know, you, you certainly weaken us at a core level. And, and that's really how this conversation um, began between the two of us. So, yes, we are- The, very, the very presumption, I'm gonna call it an enormous presumption. It's a deceit and it's a presumption. Yes. Very presumption that the creator God is male is horrifying and is so against the perception of the native mind of all cultures around the world. If you, again, as a comparative mythologist, what do I discover? I have all the books here, many of them, many of them are stored away. Uh, dozens and dozens of cultures and why everywhere do you find that the figure of the great goddess appears under thousands of names? The figure of the male creator God appears under one name and one only. He's the off planet landlord, right? He's the jealous punitive God, right? But when you look at our history, when you look at our legacy, what Jung would call the inventory of the archetypal patterns of the psyche, you find that the female is everywhere and she is our source. One of the things that you encounter in the teachings of Gnostics, but not only there, it's, it's also universal, is that the gods, they're called aeons in Gnostic writings, the gods, the divine beings are gendered. Why are there male and female gods, you see? So when you take away the female gods and you only have the male god, and there's only one male God, then you've got a really big problem going here and here yeah. in the human mind and in the human heart. That is wrong. It's what I call the malware. The Abrahamic religions are malware, which actually have an exo human source, according to the Gnostics and this of course, is one of their great heretical messages, which is shocking today as it was centuries ago. And so, so John, John, when, yeah. you, when you talk about 
um, extraterrestrial, we're really talking about this malware. We're talking about above Earth, beyond Earth, above nature, outside of us, putting putting this this deity, this God above and outside over there. It, it's not like it's a, a Martian or 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 anything no. of that nature, because so many people misunderstand that that terminology. And I, I just wanted to ground that and make certain that people understand that in 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 Christianity that God is is up there beyond God is an extraterrestrial. God is an extraterrestrial. And nobody <laughs> you're the first person I've ever heard and my my reading is limited in that sense but when I first read that it was like bingo now I understand where so much confusion is and why so many people get get lost in another direction. Well, this is something that uh, is problematic for people and I've made tremendous effort to explain it clearly and to guide people toward this perception so that they can grasp the perception in the correct way because it's extremely powerful and it's a game changer. Yes. So there are a couple of ways you could spin it. For instance, you could say, well, how about you out there? Do you find that the transhumanist technocratic ideology, which is rampant in the world today, you know, AI is going to take over everything. We're going to become hybrids between AI and human. Robots are going to take over all the work, which, by the way, is a tremendous assault on the dignity of men because men find their dignity in work. That's right. right. Uh, we're going to take make AI and have completely artificial reproduction in plastic eggs. That's a tremendous assault on women against their nat natural biological function. When you see all this, and, and if it troubles you, I have to tell you that maybe it doesn't trouble you enough. When you learn from the Gnostics that the source of that is not something human. The technocrats are not running on a human mindset. They are themselves the agents of an AI, let's say alien intelligence, not artificial intelligence. That's what AI really means. They are the agents of an alien intelligence, something that exists outside the earth, but in the solar system. And they're not Martians and they're not uh, superior beings, Anunnaki from a higher civilization. No, all of that is very muddled narrative. Yes. Basically, what they are is a extraterrestrial species that arose as the solar system we inhabit was being developed. And to know the story of how that happened, you learn the story of your divine mother, Sophia. It's all in her story. And you can find that story on sophianicmyth.org and in the book, right? Yes. Right. But you can also receive the current updated versions of the nine episodes of that story and also on Nemeter right now, which is my school, uh, we're presenting uh, a woman, finally, someone showed up, a woman reading the story, oh, wow. reading the narrative that I have restored. So the restoration of the narrative is my task, is now going out to the world in the voice of a woman, which is a huge relief to me. Very lovely. And imagine. Very lovely. <laughs> well, we will show up when, when it's time, and even if it's at the very last moment. So It is. Everything's at the last moment, and this battle is to be won at the last moment. This that is, is the last that is moment. Exa that is exactly correct. We are on the battlefield right now. Right. Well, John, could you, could you take us now um, to that next step to understand a little bit more? Because what we've just talked about is the concepts that are that are so different from anything that we have been exposed to unless we have studied the gnostics the the mystery schools the the whole pagan culture and 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 the origins of 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 the demise of of that so so for most 
for many people who are listening now who who have not any background at all in it, it, it will be difficult to comprehend. So I do highly recommend that you read John's book, Not in His Image, and go to his website and really begin to learn because everything that we have been taught has been a lie. And, and I, I, I'm a living example of, of, of understanding that every single day as I turn over another stone or, turn, or, or lift another Pandora's lid off another Pandora's box. And so let's, let's, go, let's go forward a bit, please. Well, Gnostic Intel, as I call it, in my humble opinion, is most definitely the powerful antidote to all those lies. So again, to, to orient to the root of the problem, and then we'll move on to the situation of men today and the solution, if you like, I could perhaps put it in this way. One of the controversies that happened at the beginning of the Christian era, when uh, certain ideologues, for instance, St. Paul in the New Testament, but also many other ideologues that called the uh, patristic fathers, people don't really know about them today, but they were the first men who came out and argued for this male only off planet creator God. Mm -hmm. And the Gnostics were so concerned because they had been following this Zadokim cult for centuries uh, and observing it. But as I say, it had been incubating in small cells. And then suddenly it burst open and it went pandemic in Christianity and they were very alarmed. So they stepped out of the sanctuaries of the mystery schools. They always preferred to remain anonymous. They didn't promote themselves. They were teachers. They were dedicated to the education of the races, but they, they were compelled by the situations to step out and say, hey, hold on, wait, 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 wait just a minute. This entity that you call the Supreme God, we know who this entity is. We have detected him through many millennia, and we know that he is actually a demented alien being who is against humanity and wants to destroy humanity. Well, first of all, that was a very upsetting statement and the Christians <laughs> didn't take that too well, but it gets worse. It gets worse because the Gnostics came out and said, okay, you can't handle that. That blows up in your face. Well, let's talk about evil. You're always talking about evil, aren't you? evil this and evil that and sin and evil and Satan and all this. Okay, well, we have a view of evil. Would you like to know what ours is? And of course, the Christians didn't want to know because if they heard it, they would not be able to refute it. So basically, I can speak today as those Gnostics spoke many centuries ago. And I can say this. If you look at the problem of evil in the world, real evil, I'm not talking about just incidental harm that may, people may do to each other or conflicts that people have. Human beings can have conflicts. You know, they can murder each other. Various things can happen. No, we're talking about that scale of systematic evil and deceit. So the Gnostic teacher says, if you look at that, and you try to understand how can human beings be that evil. You'll never know unless you factor in a paranormal extra human element. Because the truth is that we can't be that evil. We just don't have it in us. And likewise, we don't have it in us to comprehend something. It is paranormal. It's not, uh, it is sci-fi. It is it not is. paranormal. No, it's it is paranormal. It is extra human. And when that piece fits in, to me, I would say that for those who really benefit from what I've written in Not In His Image, that's the piece. That's where the penny drops. Oh, I can no longer go on struggling to understand how can there be so much obvious evil in the world 
unless I realize that it's not coming from the world, not entirely. And it's not coming from out of human nature. Human nature is the prey of that evil. The archons, as they call them, uh, who are the entities associated with this uh, off-planet father god, are parasites. They're like locusts. They're parasites and they come in and they just want to destroy everything. But we as human beings, we were not created in that way. We, were, we could have wars, we could have clan battles. Yeah, but we were not created to perpetrate evil on that scale. So to me, this is an essential thing for people to take on board to see what we're facing today and to see specifically how that evil and deceit is directed against the gender binary, directed against both men and women, churns them against each other, has them destroying each other, and this is the state of war we're in. You know, John, when I when I read in in not in his image uh, about the horror of the death of Hypatia, the Gnostic um, teaching teacher, I I was I was wordless. I was breathless. I was I I I I couldn't have fathomed that type of um, of evil perpetrated against anyone someone who was about um, philosophy and, 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 and developing and supporting uh, the intellectual development of societies, culture, music, the arts, um, the, the, the relationship to nature um, and, and relationship to, to, of man and woman, everything about the beauty of, the, of, of, of life, and then to quite literally um, end up having her flesh scraped from her bones by the Christians mm -hmm. who, 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 who were, who were um, unable to allow her, 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 her whole, her, her, her own being to stand alongside theirs. The, they were the, absolutely threatened by both her physical beauty and the dignity that she had as a sovereign woman, taught mathematics, philosophy, theology, you name it. And the ancient sources, these are source materials, these are not secondhand stories about her, uh, say that she could uh, match and refute anyone in arguments in theology in the ancient world, you see? So they could not allow that brilliant Gnostic intellect to live, nor could they allow the natural beauty of that woman to live. And her murder, the gruesome details of it, show how deeply that hate goes. And yet we are led to believe that uh, the hate comes from the devotees of the religion of ultimate and divine love. Figure it. Go ahead, figure it. And, that, and they did worse than that for centuries afterward. Yes. And they did worse than that, worse, as worse as that, as bad as that. In America, I cite in my book that they gathered up the natives of Central America, of the Caribbean islands, and they burned them in groups of 12 in honor of the 12 apostles. Oh, oh, oh. What can you say? Well, what you can say about it is that it's incomprehensible because it, it's not of my nature. It's not of your That's nature. That's exactly right. It's not, it's it's not, not of human, it's not of human nature. Yeah, it's not of human nature. But once you know that it's not of human nature, then you can comprehend it. That's the absolute key. Yeah. Now, I see an objection floating through my mind that some people would raise, perhaps, and saying, well, what about all the good things that have been done by Christians and all the good work they've done in the world. And my response to that is very simple. If there are human beings who are Christians and they have done genuine good works in the world, they could as well have done it out of the goodness of human nature without being Christians. 
there is no entitlement to moral superiority or goodness in being a Christian. If you are by nature a good person, then you do good to the world. Why do you need Christianity as a, as a scaffolding to exercise and express your natural good? Excuse me, but of course, there's the trick because Christianity says, yeah, you might have had natural good. Yeah, Adam and Eve in the garden might have been innocent, but you've been corrupted. But it's, John, it's even more than that. And I mean, and, and I'm not telling you this by any means, but the, the whole uh, uh, Judaism and Christianity and, and Islamic religions, all of them have a, a deity that is outside of us. It's, it's right. a non-empowered uh, triad of religions. That's right. And, 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 but, but, but that in and of itself was, was a trick. It was to disempower us. That's right. It, you could call it the subversion of conscience. Yes. So, like so there, are many, there are many people who come from the Christian um, ethics and morals who, who don't understand the, the very trickery at the, at the onset of, of, the, of those religions. Yeah, well, there's a wide, uh, widespread kind of general vague notion that goes around that, well, you can't have morality without religion. Have you ever heard that one? Yes. Yeah, religion gives us our morality. The Hebrews gave us the 10 commandments. Well, I argue in my book, and you know this well, that where, are, where there are commandments, there, are no, there is no morality, there's obedience. Right. Obedience is not morality. Right. Morality is when you follow your own conscience. So what they did, and the, and the deceit of this goes so deep, is that they substituted obedience to the Father God, or Allah, or whoever, for your sovereign conscience. You see, that's the operative term. And in the, as this conversation flows along, I want to bring it around to that term because the term sovereign is extremely important for men to recover their power, to become sovereign men. But the foundation that we're laying, I think, is, is pretty good and pretty complete. Uh, you, you, when you realize that the attack on what we call humanity is massive coming through these religions and there is nothing good about them. You know, you often hear this argument, oh, well, weren't the original teachings of Jesus really good and what a beautiful message of love. Uh, oh, but it became corrupted. I say, no, 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 I'm not going to that rehab. Okay, it was corrupted from the beginning. This is a hard, hard truth to learn. What do I call it in my book? The hardest lesson of history. That's what we're talking about. But learning this lesson is the beginning of the liberation out of those evil and deceitful systems which are operating in the world today under the guise of the Great Reset, transhumanism, the medical uh, pharmaceutical tyranny, all of that is coming from the same root ideology. So let's say we're about halfway through. Can we kind of move around and get to talking about men and women directly? Sounds very good. Okay. Because really, those are the people, those are you and I, and we've got this problem. As I've said, it's not really our problem, something that you have to get. Men and women have had their differences and their difficulties through all the centuries. But in every culture that you look into, especially into the pagan civilization, which is a flowering of culture of great beauty and intellectual strength, you find that they made these arrangements in certain ways. But 
I can't make an arrangement as a man with you as a woman if there's someone over there <laughs> manipulating both of us. Oh yes. Right? Oh oh yes. And 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 that I think that's a very in that, that's a very key point. And it it, yes. it, um, it, it it brings um a lot up for me because we see that triangulation not nature and male female but we see that interference as an integral part of so many relationships it's as if they're bred on that triangulation and i don't and i i mean that i have seen so much triangulation in in other people's lives in my lives and i think everybody's life it's that you just hit a point that just opens a door that it's in your face. It's in your face everywhere. You can't avoid it. Yes. For instance, there are so many stories about the legal system <laughs> and how the legal system has been rigged uh, in favor of women and to the devastation of men. And this is absolutely true. How women's rights, that whole feminist Marxist ideology has been rigged not to create equality of the gender, First of all, the genders aren't equal. So get that uh, idea out of your head, okay? We have our differences, but we can be treated equally in the workplace. We can be treated equally, but feminism isn't going for that, is it? Feminism says it's going for equal treatment. What it's actually going for is a very unbalanced system where men are devastated by it's the-, for the It's going for the juggler, John. It is, it really is. So I want to make it clear at the outset that uh, that uh, uh, men and women are both equally responsible. Uh, I'm going to talk about codependency. Okay, it's not our problem. Uh, there's a great saying in the recovery movement, which said, uh, "How does it go? It's not your fault." but it is your responsibility. I love this. So the, dis the destruction of that beautiful triangle and the gender binary, it's not our fault that it's come to this horrific state, but it is our responsibility to correct it. So men and women are equally responsible. They prey on each other, they enable each other in the worst ways. But if we had never had that third party influence, which is behind pornography, by the way, totally proven, massive evidence of that, uh, then we would have our own problems and we would be able to negotiate them on our own terms. We can't do that. So my premise would be here, I'm going to shift now to talk about men, because I'm a man, and I can talk about it firsthand. But the premise is, that both men and women have to step back from this train wreck and take responsibility for their part in it, you see? For enabling, manipulating, conniving, subverting that we do to each other without even understanding the forces that compel us to do that because they are so insidious. Am I making sense? Well, you are. And and, and John, I, 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 I know you'll get into this, but I, 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 I do want to say that what I have come to understand through the Travis, Tavistock Institute and the MK Ultra and and um, and just the, the the mind control that has been used to divide and conquer men and women. It, it's it's been. It, it's been complete in from what I'm seeing now that we're starting to see this whole um, ha um, um, hate campaign against white men. Yes, the hate campaign is, is so big, but also the 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 fuzzing of the genders. I mean, you 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 cannot you have to have respect and honoring of male and female. And and today we're we're seeing all of that imploding, and and so there there actually has been a very insidious uh, agenda to to reach that place which you've talked about 
so far. But I, I, you know, yes, there's codependency, but 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 we have been led, we have been deceived, we've we've been taught through the new age um, manipulation and everything, and and we have been we have been innocent until now, where we start to see that this has been a plan to destroy. The, the, the genders to to put us onto this alien intelligence or this AI through and into this transhumanist agenda. So I want to not be harsh at all on males and females because we've we've not understood. We 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 have been innocent. But now we're no longer innocent. And so now we do have to take responsibility and we can't do this codependency any longer. So I, I just had to add that in. Well, yes, in a way, it's horrible to say this, but it's good that it's all come out in the open. Yes, it is. I mean, when you have uh, transgender storytelling in the public library, uh, when you have children's books uh, being published by whom, being written by whom, look into it, uh, teaching children sexual perversion at the age of three and four, can't get any more blatant than this. And through, the world, unless, through the World Health Organization. Yes, the World Health Organization. And all of those organizations, you know, uh, are part of this evil agenda. So in a way, we are, this is the frontal exposure of the yes. attack. But the attack has to have, has to be met by a counterattack. So, I'd like to talk about a subject that's close to my heart and uh, about which I can speak, as I say, as a man who's been in recovery. If anyone knows what the recovery movement was, I don't know what the status of it is today. Is anyone in recovery today? I am, as a woman. Right. <laughs> but was, wasn't Robert Bly a part of that recovery? Right, but I never went with Robert Bly. And I have to say that I, it's interesting that you mention him because he was among a number of, there was a kind of a male advocacy movement that, that uh, developed as a sideshow of the recovery movement. Robert Bly and others, uh, what's his name? Johnson, who wrote He, She, and We. Uh, Robert, jo Robert Johnson. Yeah, Robert Johnson. Uh-uh, mm, uh-uh. They didn't get it right at all, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so to me, the core of the recovery movement consists of the, the conditions for the recovery of manhood consists of two requirements. First requirement is that women step back and take their place to defer to men. That is absolutely essential. Get out of the way. Let me have my male life. Let me reclaim my manhood. And then you can enjoy me in that way. But get off my case. Do not enable me. Do not manipulate me. And let me find myself again as a man then I can come to you as a whole man. In the meantime, if you don't mind, honey, go over there and find yourself too. <laughs> so you see, this is- well, 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 you know, I laugh because one of the things that I was realizing when I was really looking at this crisis that men were in was that, well, women, are, 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 we being, are, are we being our ultimate feminine? Are we able to receive our men? Are, are we actually able to recognize and honor and receive because femininity is about receiving and 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 I and I thought wow you know there's so much to be done for both and it's all, and about, I, respect. It's all about respect and so I'm not going to expect you as a woman to respect me as a man unless I have self-respect. So the men have to go on their path to regain their self-respect and I'd like to talk about how that can be done and women to regain their self-respect too. 
And there are hard lessons to be learned. And the things that I can say about it are not popular. For instance, it's widely viewed because of the way that so-and-so and such-and-such -such has perverted the gender binary that uh, this is the phrase, well, you know, the woman is the prize, right? I'm the man, I earn a living, I, I make money, I'm successful, and then, wow, you know, there's my prize, right? The woman is the prize. Cliche of the trophy wife. Super rich men always have a trophy right, wife, right? No, man is the prize. Man is the prize. They've got it completely backwards. And woman is the reward. These are two different things. So these are fundamental understandings of, of what the gender roles are that make the gender dynamic actually work and flourish. But you have to have each individual, man and woman, has to come from a basic place of self-respect. So I know, for instance, that if I'm with a woman in an intimate relationship, which doesn't have to be a marriage and doesn't have to last forever, but it can be honorable and it can be correct for the time that it lasts, okay? I know that I am the prize and she is the reward. It has to be a reward. She is the richness of the reward for the prize. Those two things are need each other. It's basic to the sense of human worth. So that's the first rule. The second rule, uh, not rules, that's the first. I don't like to give advice either. Let's just say, that's what I learned. I'm just telling you what I learned. Take it or leave it, okay? okay. The second is the issue of sovereignty and male sovereignty. So since we agree that men are primarily the target of this assault, why? Because men have the power to defeat this adversary. Women too, I mean, there are women warriors as well. They're in the fight, but the men are at the forefront of the fight and they always were. It was understood in pagan society with some exceptions of women warriors, which are spectacular stories that women didn't go into battle because they're the bearers of life mm -hmm. and it's self-defeating. Why, you know, if you have a clan or a community of several thousand people living in Denmark in pre-Christian times, and you have a battle or disagreement with another clan, you don't want to send your women to battle because it jeopardizes the future of your, of your clan, you know? So men are there, but I also strongly hold uh, respect for women warriors. And I want to see women with guns. I like to see women with guns. I like to see women shooting guns and male and female both need to be armed. Men need to teach women how to use arms. Women need to be armed. It's a dangerous world for women out there. So well, that's getting this, off on a tangent, but. Well, just, just to, you know, this last year I, I purchased my, my first gun. So, Bravo. Yes. And so I, I've realized that this truly is the time and, and uh, you know, it's, it's yeah. serious, it's serious stuff. It's so serious. It's going, to come to, it's going to be in some respects, nasty and bloody. There's yeah. no doubt about it because the people who hold power will never concede it voluntarily. It has to be taken away from them. This is, if you don't know that, then you're a moron. It's so obvious. And they will continue to use it. The more you concede to their power, the more power they will assume over you. Yeah. So getting back to the subject of the man, how does the man reclaim himself? So I like this term, the sovereign man. The real man needs to be a sovereign man and he needs to know what it is. So in the first place, as we just uh, discussed, there has to be a basis of self-respect and dignity. One of the uh, tactics of the assault on men is to guilt them to death. Yeah. They're not only guilty for domestic violence as if women didn't 
perform equal amount of domestic violence. They're guilty for ruining the families as if women didn't ruin families. They're guilty for colonialism and white supremacy around the world. It never ends, does it? No. I can tell you, I have never experienced violence from a man like I have from women. Hmm. Both verbal and physical. No comparison. This is a fact and many men will attest this, hmm. but you know, if a man slaps a woman, it's five years in prison, but if a woman beats a man, it's no problem, right? See, this is where it's gone. So there has to be this, a man has to really make an effort to say, I'm not gonna be held guilty for things that I didn't do. And I'm not gonna be regarded as guilty before proven innocent. I'm not. And, but at the same time, with that code of honor of a man, and honor is a big part of reclaiming manhood. So my code of honor tells me, yeah, I'm not going to accept having any guilt pushed on me. And if you try it, you're going to face the consequences. But at the same time, I will take responsibility if I've done something wrong, if I've made a mistake, if I have harmed someone unintentionally or even intentionally, I will fess up to it, but I will not allow guilt be put on me, you see? That is the first step of a man's sovereignty. Yes. So, and guilt about being white, of course, is now the big, big thing, isn't it? Just being white, you should be guilty. But look at you, you're so white. You should be guilty about that, right? This is the, this uh, insane uh, insistence on white is evil is shows that they're at the end game of their program. Yeah. But it is also the moment when they have to be opposed and, and overthrown. The other aspect of, let me say, I made some notes here and I put it, my view from my own experience, I'm not giving any advice. This is what I learned. I learned ABC. First I learned male autonomy. Okay. Now I admit that for a great part of my life, I didn't have any male friends. I only had female friends and women and girlfriends and numerous. And I needed that. I needed female company and I loved it. But I didn't realize that there was something lacking in my life. Only through the recovery movement, which I got into when I was about 42, did I start to make real male friends and then I realized wow I thought that my only friends were women and I used to defer to women too which I never do anymore and so what I realized was well wait a minute wait a minute what am I doing here I have a life and I'm making my life dependent upon the pleasure and company of women which I did then I thought something's not right about that because actually the way I live my life just as a man, that should be my pleasure. And then I can invite women into it or not. I can have my pleasure of my life as a man. And maybe there are women around keeping company with me and maybe and that's when I started to grow. You see, I started to say, Oh, I can grow out of this. I can become an autonomous man. And then my relationships to women took on a different value. They had a relative value, whereas for a long time they had a central value. You see? That's A. B was bonding. And as I said, I only experienced, you know, in my childhood, I didn't have a good father figure. I had a stepfather who never really stepped up to the role and I had a few male roles, like my math teacher in high school and this old scholar that I met of classical Greek and Latin literature. That was wonderful, but I really didn't have any male, I don't like to call them role models that, because it's not about playing roles. Roles are not authentic. It was about providing a need for me that would reflect to me 
what it was to be a young boy and so forth. So male bonding is what men need today and they need it bad. So many men are stuck in isolation and guilt and wallowing in codependency. And there's a saying in recovery, uh, you didn't get into this mess on your own and you ain't getting out of it on your own. And I, and I learned that by talking with other men intimately about my wounding, my fears and my concerns, and they talked to me, we bonded. And in that bonding, we, we grew as men. So again, I'm not giving advice, but if any men are listening to this and they better be listening to this, right? Uh, I can tell you, find buddy up if you can, possibly. I know it's difficult. I know there are men who, who say to me, I can't find any other man that I can relate to in a core honesty. But there's the got to be out there, buddy up together. You know, when I was in the recovery movement for four years in Santa Fe, it was huge. The cult of recovery was enormous in Santa Fe. <laughs> there were dozens of meetings a week of AA, ACA, CODA, Al-Anon. Uh, I started my own men's only groups. I used to go to ACA, which is Adult Children Anonymous. It's not Al-Anon. It's not ACOA. It's not adult children of alcoholics. I didn't come from an alcoholic family. It's about children who have the adult child syndrome, right? And they were mixed meetings, but I started two meetings of men only and they were glorious. Hmm. I love those men to this day. We had such moments together and men need that. If you don't know you need that, you're in trouble. You've got to know that you need that and search for it and ask for it to come to you in life. And the third C is of course codependency. That is the monster. Yeah. And you, if you don't know what codependency is, you're a hopeless moron. And if you don't know what na enabling is, you know, when you look at a bad marriage or a bad love relationship, not marriage, and you see that it's toxic and it's going wrong, if you know about codependency and enabling, you can just say, well, look, obviously. See, so this is something to be learned essential to crawl out of this pit that men have been thrown into. Those are just some of my observations. I don't give advice. I'm just telling you what I learned. So, so John, we, We have, right today, we have this raging war. We have, we have people wearing masks and we have so many men wearing masks. As many men, as many women wearing masks. What do we say about that in terms of, I mean, to, to put a cover over our face, whether we're a man or a woman, where are we today in terms of making some headway um, when we see so many people who are submissive? I mean, you, you, you can't, you can't um, be empowered. You can't be, if you're, if you're willingly wear, putting a, a face covering over your face. And, and these aren't even laws. These are just edicts. No, no. These are just bullying techniques by government elected officials who are tyrants and but we have so what what we're seeing is we're, we're seeing that people just go along through suggestion our men and our women well, so where, there's a lot of intimidation involved the fact is that it's not a law and yet if you don't comply there is a chance to have serious consequences so in my understanding, many people comply because they are afraid of the consequences if they don't comply. And all of that is also unlawful, uh, but it happens that way, doesn't it? It happens that way because of the problem of the authorities. And this, this theme can bring us back to what I was just talking about, 
and maybe, uh, you know, take us through the pass, you know, out of the box canyon through the pass, right? Uh, the archons are the authorities. That's a literal translation. And the beginning of sovereignty for men and women is to defy the authorities, any authority whatsoever. It does, it's, it's religious, pharmaceutical, the county government, any authority, the health department, any authority, defy any authority. And if we agree to do that, then that is where the unity of strength comes to overthrow this whole system. So for instance, what do I mean when I talk about a sovereign man? What is a, what is a sovereign man today? What does he look like? Well, these attributes that I discussed are really important to build the sovereign man. It has to be built just like a bodybuilder has to build its body. Sovereign man has to build the character of sovereignty. But once he does, he has to prove that he's sovereign. So he stands in his relationship to his girlfriend and his associates or to his family. He is against authority. He is the one who is the authority of conscience in that group. So today, for instance, and I know examples of this very well, friends of mine that I've met, close friends in planetary tantra, they're in family situations where, you know, the son had to go to a school, was going to a school, the school insisted that he wear a mask and the father who defied authority and acted as a sovereign man said, no, no, no. And he stood up against them and the resolution was good for the child and good mm -hmm. for the family. This is where it has to start, with this defiance against authority, see? And so the mask, by the way, is, is not a mask, it's a muzzle. It's simply a symbol of, of submission. Yeah. It's like the, <clears throat> the Muslim veil. It's, it's the indication that these, uh, Arconic parasites, which is what they are, are playing their end game. They think they've won because so many people are walking around wearing masks, social distancing, voluntarily closing their businesses. So what would the sovereign man do as a little hardware store, family store, maybe he inherited from two generations? You go and you open your store. And if the authorities come to you, you do whatever it takes, but you do not back down and that's why i that's you. and your children beside you yeah do that because this is the war this is the war because if we don't stand up for this i mean if we don't if we don't stand up for this in our sovereignty then we're lost well, we we are totally because this is life. This is our life, and they're 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 decrying that they are going to annihilate us, our life. They're anti. Are they making, aren't they making it very obvious? Are they making an open statement of it? Well, it's as, it's as clear to me as as the sky is, you know, out there in, from my window. <laughs> yeah, the great read says says. We will change what it means to be human. Yes. You will live with nothing and be happy. Yes. I don't think so. Nobody asked me if I wanted my sense of humanity to be changed. I'm quite pleased with my sense of humanity. I quite like it. Yes. Uh, nobody's going to change my sense of humanity for me. So the opposition, the refusal, the defiance, where is it going to come from? It's going to come from the sovereign men. And, and, and John, so here we have hundreds of years and certainly many decades, our entire lives, yours and my life, the sexual revolution of, of the 60s. We, we've, been, we've been dunked into that cauldron and it's, 
it's and 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 it's been infused into us. So in order to suddenly reclaim one's sovereignty isn't it's not that simple. So yes it is and it is sudden. It's okay. simple, it's sudden. It okay. really is. Uh, uh, I believe it is anyway. Very um, good. Yeah, please, I do. Please because talk to that. I've talked about this a lot, and it's a subject of great discussion in on my school and among people in the group. We talk about uh, this massive escalation of the power of the enemies of life, you know, the psychopaths. They obviously have had an advantage in the game. And what I, the picture that I am developing is that, yeah, they have this massive ascent of their power. The game is rigged. Everywhere you look, the game is rigged in their favor. But because it is so Baroque and complicated in the way they run their game, and because it depends upon so many little joints of deceit, that there's a point where that massive structure just collapses on itself. So that's what I see. And I see that as happening suddenly. If there is going to be a turnaround, I don't like to speak prophetically or dramatically, but if there's going to be a turnaround of this whole Rona scam, which is just a pharmaceutical racketeering scam, it has to be sudden. It has to happen in weeks. And it can happen in weeks. I really believe that is possible. But everything depends on, you use the word empowerment, I use the word sovereignty. Everything depends on the individuals claiming back their power and acting yes. from that power, you see? Mm -hmm. And the, the, it's gonna be a hell of a battle when the forces of opposition, such as the threat of white supremacist terrorism, let's put that in quotes, when that boogeyman, which has been entirely invented, turns out to be not invented, then you're going to see the action. And that action has to come. And I support that. And I contribute in every way I can to that, except that I don't have a sniper rifle. But if I could, I would, you see. This is where it's going. But it's not going to be all that. It's not going to be all violent. Violence is required. And this, again, is where men step up to the role, step up to the responsibility. But no, it's mostly going to, what's going to change the game is this defiance and this just don't comply. Don't do what they say. It's as simple as that. But that's not possible. If I'm making my point well, you will see, Kathleen, that it's not possible to deny the authorities if you're not coming from the sovereign place in yourself, which you yes. call empowerment. Yes, and 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 um, you know, I, I write letters of exemption for people to not wear masks. In fact, I'll I'll show you. I, it's it's I, I show you this because because I'm I'm encouraged. So in three months, this is the number of letters I I write them for people all over the world, and it's for them to to not wear a mask. It's it's in compliance with the governor's edicts or. Uh, the the gov you know various governments edicts, but the beauty of it is that people are standing up, and and they are standing in their sovereign posture, and 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 as you were saying when we first spoke, mainstream media is not going to let us know how many there are of us, but that your sense is that it is truly growing, and and when I listen to people who I work you know, write these letters for and, and um, I hear their strength. And it's both men and women, and on behalf of their children. And it's, it's very encouraging. Yeah, there's no way to know from the mainstream media how the magnitude of the pushback. There's no way to estimate they will never let you know they're losing. And they're so insane, that even when they've lost, they won't know they've lost they will be able to admit it because the nature of the archonic monster is uh, 
like a psycho, uh, a pathological liar. Mm -hmm. Pathological liar doesn't really believe that they're lying, you see. So mm -hmm. they're dead in the gutter or almost dying and they've been shot a few times, they won't even believe that they've been defeated then. But it doesn't matter because others will know that they have been defeated. So it's horrible to say this, but it has to get this bad for yeah. the sovereign power of the human races to come forward and meet the challenge. It really does. It really well, does. I, 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 think, I think that we have maybe not quite grasped the preciousness of, of life, the preciousness of, of the simplicity, of the beauty of life, that we have also been taught in a very manipulative way that everything is complicated, that we must go outside of ourselves to solve all of the problems. We must go to you know, an attorney, we must go to a therapist, we must go to a priest, we must go to a rabbi. We, we must go outside of ourselves rather than realizing that our empowerment is within. And, and when we start to claim that, we begin to see that things are much more simple. And, um, and, and I, I think that that's part of the manipulation of what, what, what we've been tricked out of understanding. And so this sovereignty that you talk about for both men and women is, is necessary. So how do we turn it on a dime? As you say, it doesn't have to be a long process. How do we, you know, maybe in the summation, you can, you can, you can just go over some of the, the salient points and, and tell us how, how do we get there when we need to get there now? Because we're at the 11th hour. We are. 11, 11th hour and 44 minutes, you know. I would say there are many ways that the realization of the great threat to life uh, dawns on people, okay? It comes from different angles. And uh, it, is, it is a complicated affair because the strategies and tactics directed against humanity are complicated. That's one way that they have an advantage see but to strike a note to strike a closing note i would go to the theme of let's say the uh the opposition between pleasure and punishment and it's often occurred to me and i've said this in some of the talks i've done on YouTube since we've been in this enormous scam. Uh, I said, I wonder if it occurs to anyone that the measures the authorities are prescribing to prevent the spread of the virus are punitive. That, doesn't it feel like you're being punished? <laughs> you can't hug anyone, you can't meet in groups, uh, artists and dancers and pianists and performers can't perform, the performers can't perform, the audience can't have the pleasure of seeing the performance. You can't sing because speaking too loud spreads the virus. And everywhere you look, the basic pleasures of life, making friends, talking to a stranger in a cafe, every single thing that we counted on as a basic pleasure of life is being stripped away. Don't you feel like you're being punished? Well, what are you being punished for? You see? And punishment, as you know, is the signature of the Abrahamic Father God. He punishes those who do not obey. And the Coviet, I call it the Coviet system. COVID Soviet, right? And the Coviet overlords will punish you if you don't obey. Mm. Well, where is your love for pleasure? How strong is your love for the simple pleasure of life? You want to sit in a cafe, just watch people, maybe talk to a stranger, you know, maybe flirt with a waitress like we used to do in the old days. It seems like the Middle Ages now when we could do things like that, right? Mm. Uh, 
make a new friend, go to a new country, be free to travel. All those pleasures are being taken away from you. Are, are you willing to look at the responsibility that you hold to regain those pleasures? And pleasure is a the thing they've attacked from the beginning. They made sexual pleasure into a sin. They made the pleasure of being in nature and communicating with the trees and the rocks and the river. They made all that satanic, demonic. And this is where it all turned bad. And this is also where it has to turn back to the truth. That's the core of it all to me. Very fine. Now, John, this is, this is a, a big question to me. Who's the they? They are the psychopaths that you see everywhere in the world, in government, all government uh, leaders are criminals, leaders of the central banks, people who run the three letter agencies, they're all criminals. You know, some people may say, I'm really afraid that, you know, oh, we know the whole financial system is gonna collapse and oh, where am I gonna be then? Hey, it's a criminal system. Be happy that it's going to collapse. Just don't let them do what they want to do. They're collapsing their own criminal system so that they can put their ultimate system in place. Let them collapse their criminal system, but don't let them put their ultimate system in place. That's the battle. That's very clear. The battle lines, I think, are, are really clearly drawn in that respect. So... So as Sun Tzu would say, in order to win the, the war, you have to know who the enemy is. Yeah, I call him the Zenosh. I use code terms. You know why. We're not on YouTube now. So I suggest to everyone a, a little takeaway from JLL, yours truthfully. The word Zenosh, X-E-N-O-S-H. And of course, it comes from the Greek Zeno, meaning foreign or alien. It's an X, but it's pronounced like a Z. So who are the X, E, N, O, S, H? Well, there are two, they are the enemy. They are the they. And they consist of two categories. They are the racial Zenosh, who are defined by their racial identity and ideology. They are the self-declared enemies of humanity. You do not find in any other mythology or ideology the Apaches, the Aztecs, the ancient Greeks, the Persians, you find no one who says, we are the self-declared enemies of humanity who shall dominate all the races. That's the Zenosh. So there are the racial Zenosh, and then there are their minions and enablers who are the non-racial Zenosh. That's the they. Thank you on that, John. And so, so the bottom line to all of this both male and female, men and women. We must stand as sovereign um, in our sovereignty. We, we, that, is our, that is our battle cry. Which yeah, is and have the courage to hate. Hate is a sovereign power. In my opinion, and I can be quite contemptuous when the moment requires, I have absolutely contempt absolute contempt for anyone who does not hate. Because if you do not hate, then you cannot protect what you love and you are hopeless and you're lost. Well, well, that's a new concept of, um, that I've embraced just very recently. And so for you to say that, it just gives me chills. Um, so, well, is there, is there anything else you would like to say at, um, before we end this conversation, which has been a real journey. And I thank you for that. One of many journeys. And it's some of these journeys are lonely. We take them all by ourselves. I've taken many lonely journeys. And some we take together. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to walk these steps with you. Well, and thank maybe the journey again. Very fine. Well, thank you very much, John. John Lamb Lash. I will put uh, John's contact information below on this um, 
uh, uh, link. And uh, John, did you want to give a, any contact information to those listening? I'm all over the internet. I'm very easy to find, but okay. if you want to go to my school, Nemeta, N-E-M-E-T-A dot org. That's the main platform of my activity today. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.